There we are. Okay. How you doing, Florence? Good to see you. Miss Dottie, Mr. Tim, Mr. Richard. Hey, Johnny. How are you? Tommy? Let's hi. See. Hi, hi. Let's see who else we have here. Uh, Mr. Tim, you are looking at us now. I can see you making some changes. Finally, it's good to change. It's good to change. Decide to be friendly today. All right, all right. We are we are glad. Um, let's see what else we have. Who else we have here? Hi, Francis. How are you doing, Miss Dottie? Let's see. There you go. Now we can hear you, Miss Dottie. How are you? Good. Good, good. Mr. Richard, how are you? <laughs> okay, how are you doing? Good, good. Is your wife coming? One, she, she has to do a restroom. Oh, okay. Thomas is coming. That's a that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. I changed playing with Miss Florence, can you hear us? Yeah. Florence, can you hear us? So we are not denying the, the, the gift of tongues. It's actually an authentic, genuine, and biblical gift. We have to start from there because we are seeing it in Acts chapter 2. But is it really the way people uh, do it out there? And you know what we are talking about. The babbling and nonsense uh, noise that people do claiming that is the gift of tongues. Is that what it is? Well, let's see here if in chapter 2 of Acts, that's what we find. The first time that we find in the, in the, in the book of Acts. So number one, Pentecost was being celebrated. Number two, when the, any feast, especially the most important ones like the Pentecost, was celebrated in Israel, anyone of, uh, over... Uh, uh, 18 years old and, and older will be um, required to come to Israel to Jerusalem to celebrate this so at this point there, uh, all the Hebrew people were uh, spread around the world but since they were required to come to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast they will come from different parts of the world and they will already have their children that were born in these other parts of the world so guess what they were in other countries, they spoke their languages. So they come to where the, uh, to Jerusalem, and now they find this happening here. Why? So we see a need here. The gift of tongues, the real biblical, uh, authentic, and genuine gift of tongue was necessary. Why? Because of all these foreigners that spoke a foreign language needed to receive the message that was preached here in Acts chapter 2. Let me give you an evidence of that. If you come down to verse 7, you will see there the list. It says, number one, they will see these foreigners will be so surprised of hearing the gospel being preached in their own language. It says, then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And now he, they continue saying, and how is it that we hear each in our own language what is the word that comes after that in your Bible? Is it language? Language in which we were born. So people from other, other parts of the world with all foreigners that spoke different languages, different from the ones that they would find in, in Jerusalem typically, are hearing, remember that these were tongues, not ears, they are hearing their language, their people is speaking, preaching the gospel in their own language. So, just based on what it says here, and now let's continue with the list. Verse 9, Persians, Emites, and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So there is a reason why Luke is giving us this list. He wants us to know 
that these people were foreigners who most likely spoke a different language. And because they spoke a different language, the gift of tongues, the real gift of tongues, was necessary. So where is the miracle here? At the moment that, that the, the disciples of Jesus were preaching at Pentecost, the gift of tongues were necessary so that they would hear it and understand every single word. So the gift of tongues were not given to the hearer, it was given to the speaker. That's a supernatural gift, and not just that they went to school to learn, to learn any of these languages here represented in the list. So now we can see that the first time that the gift of tongues show up, shows up in the Bible, in the book of Acts, is actually, is actually uh, a, a gift that was given to communicate an actual language. And that's why also the word language is used there. So when we talk about gift of tongues, according to Acts chapter 2, we are talking about an actual known language, right? Somewhere in the world, this language is known. So let's go now with that understanding from chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 10. And I want us to read, and this is the second time that we find in, in the Bible, um, um, an event that involves the gift of tongues. This is chapter 10. And you know chapter 10, what happens in chapter 10. But let's just read verse 1 so to put, in, put us in context. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion. Where were centurions from? Rome. Rome, right? So that already gives us uh, a necessity of communication. Keep that in your mind. A centurion of what was called the Italian. What do you think? We don't find this kind of information given everywhere. What do you think now Luke is giving us the information that this centurion, a Roman centurion, belongs to the Italian regiment? Because, again, Paul, uh, Luke wants us to know that a communication, a language is necessary to break the, the communication barrier that can exist when a person speaks Chinese and the other person speaks Japanese. There is a need of this gift of tongues so these two people can communicate, especially the gospel in this our case. So you know what happened in chapter 10, right? Let me just jump all the, all the way to verse 46 to see when this gift of tongues happens, right? So Peter uh, is invited to go to these uh, Gentiles, right? And the, and the dream and the, and the unclean food and the angel that's invited uh, Peter and then Peter, uh, Cornelius sent people to bring Peter. Peter goes to the house and when he gets to the house, the house is packed of people. P uh, Cornelius' friends and family members are invited by Cornelius and they are all uh, waiting for Peter so that P Peter can preach at them the gospel. Peter gets there, he preached his heart out and this is what happens when he's done with his sermon. Verse 46, it says, For they heard them speak with tongues. And magnify God, then Peter answered. And then you will see who wants to get baptized and so on. But we are seeing now again that since they were filled by the Holy Spirit, the result of that here only is that they spoke in tongues. Why did they speak in tongues here? Because we don't see every time somebody is filled by the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Why here? Number one, Romans. Number two, Hebrew people. Number three, Italians there was a need of a language so that they can, they can get the whole gospel completely and not say, I don't understand that word. I don't know what he meant. I know, I know, uh, I know uh, Greek, but I don't know Greek at that extent. So I want to understand everything. And that's why God gave these gifts to Peter so that they can hear the gospel in their own language and understand every single word. So number one, we found that in, um, in chapter 2, that it was an actual language. In, in, in chapter 10, it was an actual language. And how do we know? Let me bring this to our attention. How do we know that what took place in chapter, in chapter 10 is the same that, that happened, that took place in chapter 2? How do we know that, that it was uh, the gift of tongues and that people were um, um, received the, the Holy Spirit by speaking tongues? How do we know that? Peter actually tells us that. If we, if we go to chapter 11, to verse 15, we will see that. Peter now comes before the leaders of the, of, of the, 
of the um, uh, the synagogue, and he now he retells the story of what took place at Cornelius' house. And when he's telling them what took place, he says in verse in verse fifteen, as I began to speak, this is Peter giving the report, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Us here it is. This is why we have to pay attention. As upon us at the beginning. What beginning? Chapter two. So Peter is equating. He's saying is the same. What is happening in chapter ten is the same event. Is the same kind of event that took place in chapter two, right? So if in chapter two was a language, in chapter ten was also a language. There was a need. The need was to communicate the gospel, and so the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And the gift and the gift of tongues was given so that Peter can communicate the gospel completely, and they can understand the gospel completely. The last time we find that the uh, the gift of tongues in Acts chapter is in Acts chapter nineteen. Acts chapter nineteen. In Acts chapter nineteen, you might you might be uh, familiar with this. We we see Paul now um, interacting with a group of disciples from Ephesus who were just knowing about the Holy Spirit. Paul not only taught them about the Holy Spirit, about Jesus, but Paul also re-baptized them, which is one of the, one of the evidence that we have for re-baptism. So, so Paul now teaches them about the, Jesus, the gospel, the, the Holy Spirit, and, and the option of re-baptism. And now he says what is found in verse 6. Listen what he says in verse 6. And when Paul had laid hands on them, these are the disciples that Paul was teaching, uh, um, the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. This is again the same event that we see in the other three chapters that we found the, the speaking in tongues. Why was it given the, here? Was it because of the same reason of the other chapters? The answer is yes. Because remember, these people were Gentiles. They were, they were from Ephesus. Most likely, they knew other languages, right? So, so far, the four times we saw in the whole uh, uh, record of the beginning of the church, you see the gift of tongues just only four times. Only four times. You think out of, you, you think out of all the, the, uh, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that we find in the Bible, you think you will find more times that the Bible will speak about. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts, and only four times the gift of tongues is mentioned. I mean, the book of Acts is about the acts of the Holy Spirit. It should be if the gift of tongues is the manifestation every time of the, spirit, of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it should be everywhere in the 28 chapters. But it's not. It's only four times. So now let's go back to... Let's go back to uh, 1, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You know what? Before we go there, let's go two chapters before. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to see the context of what took place in chapter 14. Remember, context is always important when we do, when we do a serious Bible study, when we take a, a passage and we try to uh, dissect it. So uh, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look what happens there. Talking about the gifts of, of the Spirit. The gift of the, of the Holy Spirit. And let's go to verse 11, specifically to verse 11. This is talking about the gifts again. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. Talking about what the Holy Spirit does in miracles and all that prophecy. And he says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing. This is the key word. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. Do you catch, friends? Do you catch that? It's not that the Holy Spirit comes upon everyone and gives the, the one single gift to everyone. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that, number one, he does it as he pleases. In other words, he says, Dottie needs this gift, so I'm going to give this gift A to Dottie. But Tim doesn't need gift A. Tim needs uh, uh, gift B, so I'm going to give this other gift to, to Tim. Because the Bible doesn't say that, get, that the Holy Spirit gives the same gift to everyone. It gives different gifts to different people individually. We found that word there in the text, individually. He, the Holy Spirit, distributes the gifts individually as he pleases, right? So just out of that verse, we can, we can make a case 
that is not that every single person has the same gift. I mean, not everyone is a good teacher. Not everyone is a good, is a good uh, preacher. Not everyone is a good prophet. Not everyone, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, so it's every single person has their own gift given by the Lord, given by the Lord for a specific purpose. So let's move now to 27 on this same matter. 27, we are in chapter 12 still before we go to 14. 1 Corinthians 12 and verses, uh, verse 27 through 31. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. In verses 27, beginning in 27. Twenty-seven. Okay. Here it is. Um, now you are the body of Christ. The body of Christ being the, 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 uh, the church, right? And members individually. There is a word again. And God has appointed these in the church, the body of Christ. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. Do you see, number one, that when this is written, there is an order. Number one, number two, number three. Do you see where the gift of tongues is? You will think it will be the first one. If it is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, it should be the first one. Don't you think? It's not the first one. It's the last one. It's the less important of all of them. And so the list starts with apostles, then second prophets, third teachers, and so on. So, and the gift of tongues is the last one. And so not everyone, number one, number two, not everyone received the same gift, right? The gift of tongues is just part of the list of the many gifts that the Holy Spirit gives as he pleases to everyone. All right? The, Bibles, the Bible says so. So what is then, what is the real sign of the Holy Spirit? Because this is what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying, the sign of the Holy Spirit is not the gift of tongues. Friends, it's not. So what is it? What is the real sign of the Holy Spirit, of the presence of the Holy Spirit? Let's go to the beginning of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And let's see verses 6 through 8. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. This is the beginning of the, of, of, of the book that we already saw the uh, four times. Uh, that we found the, the uh, references to the gift of tongues. Now we are in Acts chapter 1, and we, we will read verses 6 through 8. He says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, this is Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he, the Lord, said to them, to the disciples, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Here it is, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Here is the Holy Spirit coming upon you. The one thing that you will receive for sure is power, right? The sign of the, mani the, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is that, is that you receive power. But what is that power for? Because I want to see it. I want to be able to see it. And you shall be, since you receive power, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the world. Do you see, friends, the real sign, the real sign of the coming of the Holy Spirit to your heart is that you want to tell everyone about what the Holy Spirit has done in you. That's the real sign. It's not the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is given so that you can do the real sign. You can fulfill the real sign of the Holy Spirit. Just like to, it was given to Peter, just like it was given to Paul. They had the sign, which was preaching the gospel, but then... The gift of tongue was given in addition to that sign so that they can preach the gospel in their own language. Is that clear, friends? So far, so good? Mm -hmm. We together? Good. So now, now we go, uh, just to, for, for us to see, before we get into chapter 14, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is the chapter before chapter 14. I already said that that is the chapter of love, where, where uh, love is described. But I want us to catch something very important about the comparison before between this gift that seems to be the most important for this for these churches. As a matter of fact, if you go to uh, uh, churches that teach this, 
you will not be uh, you will not miss one one service without them using this supposed mm -hmm. gift of pre gift of tongues. They will always use it. Why? Because they want to say the Holy Spirit is here by speaking in tongues, the way they want want us to believe. So now, if that is true, if a speaking in tongues is the sign that the Holy Spirit is present, then that should be the most important of all the gifts. Why is in the in the end of the list? And not just that. Look what Paul says before chapter 14. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's read verses 1 and 2. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or, or clanging cymbal. What is he saying? Yes, the gift of tongues is important, but the most important gift of all is to love. Let's continue. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, he's talking about prophecy. We're not getting out of the context. This is, this is the chapter before chapter 14, and, and, and he's talking about gift, what is important. And though I have the gift of prophecy, as important as it is, right? We understand that. We, we Seventh-day Adventists, we understand this gift of, of prophecy. But Paul is saying, the gift of prophecy is important. The gift of tongues is important. But let's continue reading. And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith, so that I could remove my, uh, mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So is that clear, friends? Paul is saying, yes, these gifts are important, but the gift of tongues is the one that is more important. So, so if you really want to say the Holy Spirit is here, what is it that the members of the church should be doing? Yeah. Loving each other. Right? According to, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, one more thing. People use these two verses to say, see, the gift of tongues, the, the gift of tongues is right here. Yes. But listen, Paul is not saying that he speaks in tongues. We don't have record in the Bible of, of Paul speaking in tongues. As a matter of fact, we don't, we don't see no one time Jesus is speaking in tongues. In, in that kind of tongues that people want us to, to believe. We don't see it. Here, Paul is not saying that he speaks tongues. He's saying if I speak, he is, he is supposing, right? He is, he is saying, just in, if I will, do, will be able to do that. How do we know that? He uses the word though there. Though I speak with the tongues. He's not saying he speaks tongues, uh, tongues of men, of angels. He's saying, though I speak. And, 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 and in verse 2, he would say, and though I have the gift of prophecy. Did he have the gift of prophecy? Maybe. Maybe he had it, right? And understand, but now he says, and though I understand all mysteries, the, the question here is, did Paul understand all mysteries? The answer is no, he didn't. So he's not saying that he, he knew all this, that he spoke this. He is just saying, if I, he is just making, what is that called in, 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 in grammar? Um, it's not supposition. What is another word for that? Any grammar teacher here? The if, yes. It's a condition, but what else? Um, well, uh, the word that I'm, I'm looking for is supposition. She, she's supposing. Supposing I, 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 I speak this language. Supposing I know all mysteries. He doesn't know all mysteries. He, he's, he's speaking a, in a rhetorical way. And all knowledge. Suppose I have all knowledge. Peter, I mean, Paul didn't have all knowledge. And though I have all faith, did he have all faith? He didn't. See, see, he's supposing, he's just, he's just making a case to uplift the most important of all, which is love. All right? So that's what verse 13 says. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians the, uh, 14, the next one. Okay. So now we will see here this. Uh, what people want to use to say, oh, the gift of tongues, and blah, 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 blah. That's the gift of tongues. Is that what the Bible says? Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. See, the same passage that they use to say that the, the uh, bubbling is okay, is biblical, it starts saying there is a gift more important than the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy. Right there, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to, but to God. For no one understands him, 
However, in the spirit, he speaks, speaks mysteries, but continues. If you just take these verse two isolated it, and, and isolate it, you will, you will think that's what the verse is saying. But you have to take it in the context. The moment you take one verse out of the context, you will come out with, uh, most of the times, with wrong interpretations. Because there is a reason why these verses belong to a unit in, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures. So verse three, verse 3 says, But he who prophesies and speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He's again, what Paul is doing here is comparing the gift of prophecy with the gift of tongues. And he says the gift of prophecy is much more needed and edifying. He who speaks in tongue, in a tongue, edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all, all spoke with tongues, but even more, even more than that, see the comparison in prophecy still gets up. Even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with, with tongues. Can that be clearer than that? Greater. It's saying prophecy here, tongues here. But if you want me to believe that the gift of tongues is the, is the greatest expression of the, the, uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then you have to show me where the Bible says that this is the most important of all the gifts. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what my Bible says. For he who speaks, we are still in verse 5. For he who prophesies is greater than, than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed the, he interprets that the church may, be, may receive edification. When people, and, and, and I'm pretty sure some of you have been in this kind of uh, services, when people start babbling this way, sabala, 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 papala, 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 these kind of things, no one understands. And those people that claim to understand, I can bet you... Gibbles. They are always making these things up. And I have talked to people that decide to make up, to uh, make it up because they think, they think since they, they believe that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is manifested by this babbling, I have to, I have to uh, make it up so that I can fill in, so that they will not think that I don't have the Spirit. So many people start doing this thing. I have talked to these people doing this thing, just uh, creating this that is not actually coming from the Spirit, as they claim, just because they want to fill in. This is dangerous. This is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So look what verse 6 says about the same thing. We are in First Corinthians uh, verse 6 now. But now, brethren, remember the comparison. Verses 1 through, through 5 is the comparison before, between prophecy and and gift of tongues and prophecy is is um more important than that as yes yes thomas charismatic churches that's right so verse 6 says but now brethren if i come to you as speaking with tongues what shall i profit you unless i speak to you either by revelation by knowledge by prophesying or by teaching so this is what what paul is doing now let me ask you this question we already studied what the, the book of Acts says about the gift of tongues, real languages. What do you think the understanding of Paul is? Yeah, you think Paul, yeah, right? You think Paul believes that <laughs> sabala, sabala, babala, babala is the gift of tongues? Or will he, the writer of half, the, half of the New Testament, will understand what the book of Acts says and know about what the book of Acts says? I believe the second one is the answer to this. Paul knew that when we talk about the gift of tongues, we are talking about languages. And you know what? Paul at least spoke four different languages. He spoke Greek. He spoke uh, Aramaic. He spoke most likely uh, Hebrew, or at least read, understood Hebrew. And most likely he spoke Latin because he was a Roman citizen. So he knew about the gift of tongues. But now there is a gift of tongue. There is a, a, a language, a knowledge of a language that is natural. That means you went to school, you were born in a country where this language was spoken, so it's natural to you. There is nothing supernatural about that. The gift of tongues is a supernatural um, gift. It's a, it's, a, it's a gift given to you because of the necessity out of nothing. In other words, it is a miracle. It's like right now, 
I, I only have Samoans here in this, in this class, besides uh, Johnny and, and, and Ben. I know they understand that. But I only have Samoans here in this class, and from one moment to another, never being in Samoan, Samoan Islands, never being at school studying Samoan, I started speaking in Samoan. That is the gift of tongues. That is the gift of tongues. Now, if, if Ben says, let me say something, and he started speaking in Samoan, that's not the gift of tongues because Ben was born in Samoa. He knows the language, right? So, so uh, in my case, if, do I have the gift of tongues because I am speaking English and I, my language is, is Spanish? No, because I went to school, because I, I have been studying. I'm still studying. I'm still growing in this language, right? So this is something naturally, that naturally um, 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 is growing in me. But when we comes with the gift of tongues, is something that they, that's why these people were surprised in Acts chapter 2. Galileans is speaking tongues? I mean, Galileans were fishermen. They didn't go to school to study. And so they hear them even without accents, right? These were, these were people speaking like names to them. And so they said they're speaking the languages that we were born in, right? Because it happened from one moment to the other. That this was a miracle that took place because that's what the gift of tongues is. It's a miracle that is given, that is performed by God when there is a need. If everyone speaks English here, and everyone with a, with a little uh, uh, hard time or effort understands me speaking English, why do we need a gift of tongues? Why do I need to speak in Chinese if I can communicate with you guys in English? Keith, my brother, hey. this is a miracle. Talking about miracles, Keith is my brother from Denver. So good How to you see you, brother. It's good to see you too, Rudy. Thank you for joining us today. How's everybody doing? And good, good. They are muted, actually. <laughs> They're muted. So we're talking about Keith. We're talking about the gift of tongues. And uh, we have gone through several chapters. We are actually to the end, actually, the last portion of the study. So uh, we are in chapter 14, studying chapter 14 of First Corinthians. And uh, so, again, this is a supernatural gift is not one that i went to school to get right it's not one that i was born into right i was born in, in ecuador and because i was born in ecuador and i was raised in ecuador i know spanish that's not that's not a gift right that is that is something that i i i learned as was i, I was coming up and so verse 7 says even things without life whether flute or harp when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction. Listen to this. I mean, Paul is making it clear, but if you just take the verse, verse two, I, in a, uh, in take it away from the context, you are violating the unity of this, of, of this uh, chapter. He says in verse seven, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played so he says it has to be understood you, it has to be understandable you have to actually get it and that's why he's saying that because the gift of tongues is an actual language again if i come here and i speak chinese and only chinese and suddenly you hear me speaking in english now you can say this person has the gift of tongues that's the gift of tongues that that the bible talks about friends let's jump to verse 10 Oh, if you want to read verse 8, it says, For if the trumpet makes a, an, a, an uncertain sound, what would be uncertain? That's uncertain because no one knows what is coming out of my mouth. No one understands what I'm saying. So that's uncertain in the question, in the rhetorical, funny question that Paul asks. How, who will prepare for battle? If someone comes and says, The enemies come, the enemies come, instead of saying, Enemies come, they say, Babala, sabala, sabala, babala, babala. How will I know that I have to prepare? You understand? So it has to be, it has to be something legit, something that is understandable, something that I can understand. That is the proper biblical, genuine, and authentic uh, gift, gift of tongues. Look what verse 10 says. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Why is he talking about languages in the world? Because that's what the gift of tongues is. And why is the gift of tongues necessary? Because you need to communicate. You need to communicate the gospel to others 
And if there is a, if, if there is a, a language barrier, the Holy Spirit will tear it down by giving you the gift of, of tongues. Is that clear, friends? Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Are, are you guys still here? Yes. Okay, awesome. Awesome. So, so th this is what Paul is saying here. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, listen to what Paul, Paul says it here. We don't need to even go anywhere else. Paul says it. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to them who speaks and, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. What does that mean? A foreigner of this country, a foreigner, somebody that never been in this country comes from China. What language that person will be if he didn't go to school? What per language that person will know if the person never went to school? Chinese is a foreigner to this country. You cannot communicate with somebody that doesn't speak your own language. Paul is saying it, it's so clear. When we really come to the passage, to learn what the passage says and not to impose what I want to believe. So even so, you since you are zealous for a spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. See, the gifts of God are given to God's people for the edification of the church. So if you have an English church where everyone speaks English, what do you need to come and start uh, speaking in another language, even if it is an actual language, you don't need that if you know the same language that everyone speaks there. That considering uh, being a real language. Now, even worse, uh, ne less necessary would be if we come in, into an English church knowing English and I start saying, Babala Sabala, Babala Sabala. How would you understand? What would you get out of that? What is the benefit? What is the edification on that? There is none. There is not. So let me show you that uh, what the Bible says in, in, um, in agreement to what we have said so far of first, of first uh, Corinthians chapter 14. Let me show you what languages are for. Let's go to, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 2 again. Acts chapter 2. We saw that bef before, but I want us to go back up there and so that Keith can also see it. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, four through 7. Acts chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. So you will see what languages actually are. And Paul already said that, but I want you to, to see it in a, different, in, a dif in a different kind of language. Um, let's see. Yes, Thomas. Yes, doesn't edify the church, right? The bubbling doesn't edify the church. So uh, we are in Acts chapter 2 and verses 4 through 11. 2, 4 through 11. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. We already read this, so I'm going to read it really fast. And it began to speak with other tongues. This is the word glossa in the Greek, by the way, that people, people want to use to represent the babbling. They call it glossalia. It talks about an actual language, actually. Glossa. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in, in, in Jerusalem, Jews, uh, devout men from every nation under heaven. Why is this? being mentioned because the writer wants you to know that there are foreigners coming to you to town in a to a city where greek and aramaic, aramaic were the languages right so and when this sound occurred the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking him in his own language language that they knew and if you don't you don't get it from there he will give you a list that we already read then they were all amazing marvel, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, foreigners from Rome, people that spoke Latin, both Jews and proselytes, all these people, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them uh, speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. You know what? They understood. That's what they knew, that it was about the wonderful, the wonderful works of God. If it were sabala, sabala, babbly, babbly, how would they would know that they were speaking about the wonderful works of God? They understood so that they were all amazed this is verse 12, and perplexed, 
saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And then Peter uses this to preach the gospel and then one more time. And that's the greatest sermon that we hear from this man, Peter. So you can see that languages are actually to break the barriers of communication so that the gospel can be transmitted. That's the important reason why the gift of tongues is given, actual languages. And when Paul talks about this, and we already read it, we will go back to the chapter. We're almost done, friends. First Corinthians chapter 14. Let's go back to uh, the passage that we started today. We will see again that when, when, when Paul talks about speaking in tongues, he refers to an intelligent, intelligent way of communication. First Corinthians verses six, uh, chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. We've read that. But again, just the first one. I will, I'm going to read verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you as speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, clear message, by knowledge, clear message, by prophesying, clear message, or by teaching, clear message? See, Paul is talking about an intelligent way of speaking, not only making noise with our mouth, right? And so that's why in chapter 14, in verses 26 and on, he will teach the church how to be in order. Because people were coming. Remember that. Remember that uh, Corinth was a port. You know what happens at, at ports, uh, port cities? Just like Tacoma. People from all over. I've never seen so many churches like in Tacoma. I mean, Denver, Denver attracted a lot of people from everywhere. But Tacoma, you see, you see uh, uh, Russian churches. You see uh, Korean churches. You see uh, 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 Hispanic churches. You see, I mean, Samoan churches. People from all over because that's how port cities are, right? And that's what Corinth was. Corinth was a port and, and attracted people from all over the place. Mm -hmm. So that's why when they, were, when they came together on Sabbath to worship, they were everyone speaking at the same time. Guess what? Speaking different actual languages. So Paul comes and said, this is not good, guys. Come on. Let's put an end to this because it's becoming just uh, disgrace instead of worshiping God here we're just making noises not because they were saying babli 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 and sabala sabala but because each one of them one was speaking Russian another one was speaking Chinese another one Japanese and that was just noise because not everyone spoke spoke uh, uh, Latin there or, or Chinese or whatever in, in this in this condition so he gives what we find in first Corinthians chapter 14 number one one at a time right to keep order one at a time number two Two or three, or three, no more in a cult, no more in a, in a service, no more than two or three should be preaching. You can find that in verses 26, 27, 28. And also he talks about interpreter. Interpret is one that it speaks the other language to. It's like somebody from Ecuador comes and preach, preaches to you guys and he doesn't know English and I start to translate it to you. That would be an interpreter. Me translating from a known language, an intelligent language, to another known intelligent language. So finally, we will, come, we will end on time. Praise God, praise God. The Holy Spirit is poured, it is poured on a specific group. Let me show it to you. Acts chapter five. This is the last, the last two passages that we will see. Acts chapter five in verse 32. Acts chapter five and verse 32. Look what it says, talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It says, and we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given. Here's the key. To whom does God give the Holy Spirit? To those who obey him. Here's the key. And I have known. And I don't want to speak anything bad about the, the other, other uh, these kind of services that we're talking about. But I have seen people even drunk saying that they have the Holy Spirit. They have the, the gift of tongues. Right? This is a direct mm -hmm. disobedience, disobedience to God. Let me, let me give you one more. John chapter 14. This is the last one. John chapter 14. For us to know what is to obey God. John chapter 14. What is for the Bible to uh, obey God? This is John chapter 14, and let's read verses. What do you think? What do you, what do you guys think I'm going to? Verses 15 
and 16, right? So John chapter 14, verses 15 and 16. So Acts chapter 5 and 32 says that those who obey God receive the Holy Spirit. And now verses 15 and 16 says, Jesus is speaking, red words. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. What is, who is the another helper? Who is the another helper? Is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. I will give you another helper that he may abide with you. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? Loving Jesus. How do you show that you love Jesus? Obeying his commandments. The Bible is clear, friends, don't you think? Can I hear an amen so I know that amen. I am by myself here? So the gift of tongues is biblical, is genuine, and is authentic. But you have to respect what the Bible says to say we are talking about the gift of tongues, actual language, and not uh, just uh, bubbling or making noises to, to say that you are, have received the Holy Spirit. That's not the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so it, it is dangerous, by the way, because I don't, don't have the verse now, but there is an occasion where uh, somebody was making this kind of noises, bubbling. But you know what? In, in the Gospels. But you know what? That person that was doing, making those noises was demon possessed. Yes. Yes. And Jesus came to cast that demon away from that person. The one time that we see somebody bubbling in the gospel, I can find the, uh, the, uh, the uh, passage later for you. But the one time that we find somebody bubbling in the Bible was somebody that was demon possessed. So be careful with that. Be careful, uh, when, uh, be careful when you try to play with something that the Lord hasn't given you. The gift of tongues is a supernatural gift that actually is giving a knowledge of a language, known language that is necessary to, be, to uh, transmit the, the gospel to people. All right. So I'm going to mute you all. If you behave and don't make noises, you will be able to, to speak. All right, so it is two minutes before eight, before we praise, we, before we praise and pray our God. Is there any comment, any question, any disagreement? I attended a, uh, the Apostolic Faith Church before I became a Seventh-day Adventist, and they believe very strongly in the idea that you didn't have the Holy Spirit until you spoke in tongues. Mm -hmm. And I think God actually prevented me. Mm. It's probably good. Mm. Mm. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you for the comment. Any, any, other, any other experience? Any other comments? Yeah. He wasn't that interested. What was that? Any other comment? I do, I do have an experience on that. There were, there were these friends who went to one of those services. And uh, one of them was uh, uh, German. And uh, the, the uh, preacher, whoever was in the, in the platform, started speaking in tongues. And uh, the German got so um, um, scared of what he was hearing because the guy was actually speaking in German, but he was praising the devil instead of God. Oh. And, and so he said to his partner, hey, let's go, let's go out, let's go out. This, this guy is saying just crazy things there. Let's leave. And so we, we need to be careful when we try to, we try to impose to the Holy Spirit, what we want Him to do uh, with us. Mm -hmm. Any other comment? Any other question? So, uh, Keith, I'm going to send you the recording of this video so you can see it from the beginning where that we start. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. I had a, I had a question. You were talking about um, we're Paul talking about everybody coming in together. And everybody speaking a different language. Uh -huh. Now, if everybody spoke a different language in your in your in your description, and everything does that mean that for every person that was in that crowd or uh, uh, listen, or having having the uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, that that means that everybody that was there that had spoken a, a different language. They all had to have the gift of tongue in order to understand everybody. And that's what I meant when I said, remember that it was the, the gift of tongue, or it was tongues of fire and no ears of fire. 
That means that the ones that were speaking, let's see. Okay, that means that the ones, there you go. I think I got it. I got it this time. Okay, so that means that the ones that were speaking were the ones that received the gift. Not the ones that we're hearing. The, word that, the ones that were speaking. That's why they say we're hearing our language in, uh, in our own, our native language, right? The yeah. one that we were born in. So the, the gift is given to those, to the speaker, not to the hearer. Oh, okay. And okay. that's why I interpret it is necessary, right? That's why Paul says later, if somebody is going to speak a, a foreign language, have an interpreter, right? Yeah, okay. I have a question. <clears throat> yes, yes, Donna. Um, on uh, 1 Corinthians 14, um, verse um, 15, it says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. What does that mean? 1 Corinthians where? First Spirit Corinthians. and pray with the understanding. 1 Corinthians what? Which verse? Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, um, 15. Therefore, let him who is speaking a tongue pray that he may, he may interpret, that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, if, we always need to catch those little words. He's not saying he does that. He's saying, if I do it. Again, it's a, it's a, I, I don't get the, the word there that is need to, that need needs to be uh, utilized, uh, but supposition is the only word that comes to my mind at this point. So he's supposing that he would be able to do that. He's not saying that he is doing it. So he says, "For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful." Paul is in the context that we're studying here. He is talking about the benefit. Uh, the benefit that will be brought to everyone and not just to him. So that's why he's saying, if I understand this, if I'm talking about, if I started speaking in Spanish here and no one knows the Spanish, that would be, well, Vivian knows, but that would benefit me only, no one else. So why would I do that is what Paul is saying. Why don't I speak a language that everyone can, get, can, can be benefited and then we are all, the body of Christ, the church of God will be benefited. Yeah, I understand that, but it's verse 15 I was oh. asking. So, understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. So, understanding and pray, those two things go together. When you speak, that's why we're saying that Paul, Paul is talking about the intelligent and, and understanding language. You need to understand what you're saying. You need to understand. Pray, pray with the spirit. Understanding though, the word understanding is next to it. So okay. many, and this is this is another. Uh, this is a great point that you bring in because I didn't touch on this. Many people think that uh, okay, you don't speak at a church, but you can speak at home when you pray. Well, Paul is saying that when you pray, you also have to to pray in the spirit and understanding, meaning you need to understand what you're saying. But okay. if you start praying and saying, sabala, babala, babala, you don't get it. You don't know what you say. Even if you try to make it up, you will not be able to, to, uh, to understand what, this, what this, uh, your, your lips are saying. And it's dangerous because when you try to practice that and to try, you try to, uh, uh, again, uh, make it happen, you are inviting, you're opening the door to the demons that want to get into any opportunity that they can get. So that's why this, this thing is dangerous. Verse 16 answers that too. Oh, oh, oh okay. Otherwise, if you, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? See, again, understand it. They need to understand. And you're giving of thanks since he, since he does not understand what you say. Great. Thank you, Tim. So, so again, Speaking and understanding, they go together. What is that language that can be spoken and can be un understood? The language, the, an actual language. A Japanese can be understood by a Japanese. A Chinese can be understood. Uh, Chinese language can be understood by, by a Chinese and so on. So you have the, the speaking and you have the understanding both to, together according to the text.
Thank you. Yes, because those that um, speak in tongues say they're they're speaking, praying in the spirit. That's what they say. Right, but but it says and a spirit and understanding. Understanding. Yes. And we now know that speaking in the spirit is the gift that the spirit gives, but the the spirit doesn't give uh, doesn't give the kind of of uh, gift that they want to understand. We already right. studied it in the Bible. Right. So yeah, mm -hmm. even if you just take the spirit, the spirit doesn't give the babbling, babbling, babbling. He doesn't give right. that. He gives actually an actual language. Right. Awesome. Great questions. Any other questions? Any other comments? Yes, Pastor. Um, I am not understanding um, Corinthians 14, verse 2. Um, in relation to verse four, when it says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So I'm thinking, isn't there another form of speaking in tongues where you're not edifying other people, but your, your spirit is speaking to the Lord and mysteries are being spoken? I know that's what they say in other like charismatic churches. Right. That's so I'm, I'm just not understanding that part. Right, and that's why people defend people that understand the gift of tongues being uh, uh, this bubbling. Um, they defend that that when you pray, it's okay. But we already saw it. Even if verses two, and I'm gonna get back there, but even if verse two and four are not clear, that's why these are not the only two verses in the chapter. If you continue mm -hmm. reading, you will say, "Oh, praying and understanding. Oh, okay, the spirit and understanding they go together." So we're talking about an actual language. So what is what is this actually saying? For he who is speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. A tongue, a known, understanding, intelligent, actual language. So that's why I went, I went to Acts first to understand what a tongue is, or the gift of tongues is. Because once we understand that is the gift of tongues is always a, a known language, then when we come to read here, you can even replace uh, the word tongue by known language. And it'll be okay. It'll be understand, understandable for, for you and for me. For he who mm -hmm. speaks in a known language does not speak to men, but to God. For no one uh, understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. So again, remember that the, what's happening here in the church at Corinth is that we have foreigners, people that didn't, is, didn't speak one language. All of, all of the ones that were in this place didn't speak the one language. So they were speaking Russian, some other people were speaking Latin, others Hebrew, others Aramaic, others Greek. And so it was, it was a circus there in this place. And so Paul is saying, if you, even if you preach in your known language, I know you understand you're speaking to God, but you are not edifying the church. So when you are in church, do this. And let me give you an example, a, a practical example of this. Praise the Lord for this. This is what will be to fulfill verse two. I come, I go to a staff. And I preach in English, I pray in English, but I come to my home and I pray in Spanish. Will that be okay? Yes. Yes, because Spanish is a known intelligent uh, uh, communication tool. So I can talk to God, God will understand because I am, I am understanding what I'm saying to the Lord. Because it has to come from here. Remember that prayer is the opening of, of our hearts to God. But how will I open my heart if I don't know what I'm saying? I need to understand first what I'm saying to the Lord so that he can understand. So by me saying, blah, 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 I'm not getting anything. I'm not opening my heart. I'm not saying what took place in my house today or my life today because I'm just making things up. Is that your... <laughs> Does that respond to you? Does that answer your question? I'm still a little puzzled because there are people who pray to the Lord, they're not edifying anybody else, but in verse 4 it says they're edifying themselves. True, they're not edifying anybody else, you know, they're not helping anybody else or teaching anybody else or anything, no. but aren't they in some way edifying themselves? No, because I cannot edify myself if I said blah, 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 but I can edify myself if I, did, if I said Mi Señor, tú eres mi Dios, tú eres mi Padre, tú me controlas, tú vives en mí, tú me salvas. I'm edifying myself because I understood every single word that I said in Spanish. But if I say blah, 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 I'm not edifying myself because I don't understand what I'm saying. Okay. 
<laughs> so there's no way that you can speak in some type of supernatural language what more? and the spirit will understand you even though you're not understanding what you're saying. But the spirit doesn't need to be benefited. I am the one that needs to be benefited. The spirit doesn't need me. I need the spirit. So I need mm -hmm. to understand what I'm saying. Daddy, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, something about the experience I had when I was going to this other church. There was one time, and I really believe God stopped me, when I did come very close to speaking in a tongue, so to speak. But it was quiet enough that nobody else could hear it. I thought about that afterward, and one of the reasons that I did end up living, leaving the church even before I met the Adventists was because I stopped and I thought about that experience, and I began to realize that I was opening myself up for power and not necessarily God's power. When a person does start to actually let something else take over, you don't know what it is until you see the manifestation of it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, I, I have heard stories about people who were in church and this was years ago and the spirit supposedly fell and they ended up doing things they shouldn't have been doing because it was not God's spirit. If you are not in control of your mind and your thoughts and your heart and you haven't given those to God, you may be letting something else in. Right, right. Uh, uh, thank you, Daddy. Another point of this uh, verse, um, two more points of verse two, is that, is that number one, remember that what's happening in these verses, in verses one through four, is a comparison between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. So don't miss that part too, because mm -hmm. he's saying the edifying of yourself because he's going to compare it with the edifying of many more people. So what would be better? Benifying, ben, uh benefiting um, 5,000 people or just one. So that's, that's his point. That's Paul's right. point. He's comparing more than saying it's okay to do this or it's okay to do that. He's comparing these two things to demonstrate that the gift of prophecy is more important than the gift of, t of tongues. And again, remember that uh, speaking in tongues is already known that is not um, an, unknown, uh, an unknown language, but a language that you know. And so you can be blessed because you understand what you're saying. All right, so uh, what, uh, what I like about this is that I know you guys will continue studying and, and digging more into this and getting more questions. More questions will come and this is good. That's, that's what this study is for so that we will see, okay, um, I have more questions. That's great, that's all right. It's okay to question this because that's how we learn. Any other question or comment before we come to study? We have taken, this is the first time, just because it's, Keith is here, we took a little more time. Uh, we normally end at eight o'clock here, uh, but this time uh, we have taken a little more. So, any more, any other comment or question before we come to an end? Oh, the the second point that I was going to say in those verses is that remember that the gift of tongue is for is for the uh, spreading of the gospel. So, if I'm just praying to the, to the spirit or praying to God, where is the spreading of the gospel there? That's another one that we have to ask when it comes to understanding that passage. To, to the sister that asked us the last question, is that, was that Jenny? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. So yeah, I mean, that, that again, you have to bring that into, into the, the uh, reasoning there in these verses. Uh, if, I, if I just use another language, even if it is just my language, to talk to God, where is the, if it were the gift of tongues, where is the spreading of the gospel there? No, I'm not, I'm not preaching the gospel to the spirit. The spirit knows it. He doesn't need, right. need me to. It's just to in that verse, it just says, and a tongue does not speak to men. So it just seems like there's a speaking to men in tongues right. and there's one that's not speaking to men. That's right. And That's what because, I was just getting from that verse. It's because of the comparison is that he says that because he's comparing that with, not with another gift of tongues, but with the mm -hmm. gift of prophecy. The two gifts are okay. being compared here. Gift of prophecy okay. and gift of tongues. Already. <laughs> okay, so we are going to pray now. We are going to pray. And uh, since we took a little longer than usual, let's see. Let's see. Uh, can I pray? Can I pray? And oh, we close yeah. our session? Yeah. 
Any praise before we pray to our Lord? Every, every praise. Any praise. Any praise. Anyone has a praise to our Lord before we pray to our, to our God? I, I have a praise. Um, my daughter-in-law and grandson came over at nine this morning and two teachers from his school drove by to say happy, you know, ending of the fourth grade. And they spent the whole day with me. We had our